Okay, so Revelation chapter 8. At the opening, at the opening, that is weird grammar, sorry, I'm reading this really old Bible. At the opening, the seventh seal, seven angels had seven trumpets given them. Another angel put its incense to the prayers of the saints on the golden altar. Four angels found their trumpets and great, sound their trumpets and great plagues follow. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer and there were given unto him much incense that he could offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and there were ca they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountain of, fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died because of the waters, because they were made bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Yeah, so we'll start with that. Okay, so as we said, as the seventh seal, which both closes the first sevenfold vision and opens the second, we have the seven trumpet angels. So the book of the seven seals showed the misery of our lives in this fallen world. And the vision of the trumpet angels is gonna intensify uh, this vision as we make another loop around the spiral. So as we said uh, at the beginning, this is a John thing. John always does this. He does it in his gospel. He does it in his epistles to a degree, but in Revelation it's writ large. He spirals. So he starts, he has a point, and he makes his point, and then he makes his point again, and he makes his point again, and every time he goes around the spiral, it intensifies his, his uh, emphasis, gets more intense. So the story is going to get more and more and more intense every loop around the spiral. So we're going to see what we just saw in the seven seals, but bigger, you know, harder, more, right? Uh, and it will be more from the perspective of heaven than from the perspective of earth. So uh, John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, drives home the point that the life of a Christian is one of trial and misfortune on this side of the veil, but don't lose hope regardless of that. The battles here and there go on, but the war, he will remind us, the war has already been won. Christ has already won the victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. And the devil, in response, continues to lead us astray. Satan's cunning. He tells us exactly what we want to hear. And God remind us where true peace and comfort lie in Christ and his cross. And that was by uh, the Reverend Thomas Messer who wrote that little part. Uh, that's why we need to constantly be reminded and to constantly hear the story of salvation, to constantly receive his means of grace, to put on the whole armor of God, to take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one because he keeps firing at us. We need to continually be rearmed. 
Okay, so verse one, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Um, in the first century, Jews had a tradition that held that there would be silence over the world before the end comes, before the very end, like the trumpet sound and Christ comes, right? They, they've held a tradition that before the end of days, right before the end, there would just be silence, like the calm before the storm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that comes to us from 4th Ezra, uh, chapter 6, 39 and 7, 30. So 4th Ezra, that's not even in the Apocrypha. That is in the Pseudepigrapha of the uh, Old Testament. So you have 1st and 2nd Ezra, 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 1st Ezra is in the Bible. 2nd Ezra and 3rd Ezra, I think, is in the Apocrypha. 4th Ezra isn't even in that. Uh, but it is another one of those Jewish uh, apocalyptic uh, pieces of literature, and it talks about this, uh, this short period of time before the end when there will just be silence, and John is alluding to Did that. Did they get into the Catholic Bible? Hmm? No, that's not, that's not even in, in the Catholic Bible. So if, it, if it's in the Apocrypha, it would be in the Catholic Bible, uh, that we just keep it separate. So no, Fourth Ezra is just a pseudepigraphical book. Uh, and again, this half hour, that's just symbolic language, which means a short period of time. Uh, you'll see these other phrases going to be coming up like a time and times and half a time, because mm -hmm. it sounds neat when we say it that way. Uh, but it just means a period of time. And the number 30, a half hour, uh, or... 30 months or a year and a half or half a year. Those are all symbolic durations that mean a period of time or some, not all. Like a third means some, not all. Does it literally mean a third? Not necessarily. It just means a bunch, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. Not even a majority. So this could mean like a split second. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it could be like what's happening, like enough time for everybody to go, yeah. Because at the end, I mean, we're all going to know it. Like believer and unbeliever alike, they're all going to be like, yeah, mm -hmm. there won't be any doubt. Okay, so verse two, the seven angels who stand before God. Sometimes angels mean messengers. In chapter one, they meant pastors of the seven churches. Here it means real, actual angels. So for once, they're actual, real, actual angels. The seven angels who stand before God uh, in Jewish tradition, again, in, and I mentioned, I'm going to keep mentioning Jewish apocalyptic literature, particularly the book of Enoch, because John draws on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the first Enoch is alluded to in the New Testament in several places, uh, particularly James. So in Jewish tradition, uh, particularly first Enoch, chapter 20, uh, verses 1 to 8, there are seven archangels. So you ever wonder, where do the seven archangels come from? Because how many archangels are mentioned in the Bible? Two in ours, and, and what, three in the Catholic one? Mm, so you have, and actually only one is by name called Archangel, and that would be Michael. Yeah, Gabriel, Gabriel is, is Gabriel's a herald angel. We call him an archangel, but he's not called an archangel. It's an assumption. And then you can make the argument that Michael isn't an angel. It's actually Christ. His name means who is like God. Say that again. Michael, you can make an argument that Michael is the pre-incarnate Christ when he appears. Michael is the angel of death. He's the destroyer, He's which, is, which is the pre-incarnate Christ in that story. The angel of death, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. That's the manifestation of God in his creation. Oh. I hold to that. I, I have uh, my strict interpretation of theophany uh, that holds that uh, Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. I mean, the pre-incarnate Christ is everywhere in the Old Testament. Anytime God interacts, manifests where he has to interact with us, that's the pre-incarnate Christ, that's the Son. And then who else is going to come into our flesh and interact? The Son. Okay, so the, you can't actually make an argument that Michael is actually Christ. But let's just say he's an archangel. So you have Michael and Gabriel. Then you have Sariel, which is means command of God. Michael means who is like God. Uh, Gabriel means God is my strength. Then you have Raphael, not the Ninja Turtle. God heals. Raguel, friend of God. Uh, Remiliel, who is thunder of God. And then Uriel, God is my light. 
comes. So those are the seven in Jewish tradition. Those are the seven archangels. Uh, and then in the book of Enoch, if I'm not mistaken, there's like a couple hundred angels named by name. Um, oddly enough, uh, in metal, they, they like to uh, refer to archangels and stuff in the Old Testament and death metal songs because it, it sounds cool, I guess, because the imagery is so bizarre. So they have uh, Azrael is the one they call on. It's like, Azrael? I got to look that up because I feel like I should know that name. And it's no wonder I don't. It's not in our tradition. It's actually in the uh, Islamic tradition. He's, he is an archangel. And Azrael is the angel of death. He's the destroyer. So hmm. when these death metal kids are talking about wanting Azrael to take them to the next life, they're actually praying to Jesus because Jesus is the angel of death. They didn't think that was funny when I pointed it out mm -hmm. on a message board. I go on there and mess with them quite a lot. But it's like, yeah, you guys are praying to Azrael. You realize it's Jesus, right? It's like, He's actually from this tradition, which means he's the angel of death, which means in our tradition, the angel of death is actually the pre-incarnate Christ. So you're praying to Jesus to take you out of this world and take you home. Good job. You guys are now a Christian metal band. They did not like that at all. <laughs> anyway, it's fun. All right, so the archangels, right? They're God's elite force. They are employed by him to make some important announcements, right? Like Gabriel, which is why we call him. Right, so... These are not, as I said, the seven angels of the seven churches. These are seven different angels. Uh, but they are the same seven angels we will encounter later in chapter 15. They'll show up again. Uh, in scripture and in ancient times, trumpets were used uh, to give signals for events like the beginning of battles and a war to accompany announcements or important events. Um, these seven archangels, I'm calling them archangels now. It's okay to call them that. Uh, they're herald angels, so call them archangels. Uh, they are heralding various plagues, natural ones, and demonic ones, uh, which will strike the human race, in particular those who were not sealed, in the vision we just saw where the elect were all sealed. And the purpose of these acts of God's judgment is to move people to repentance, which we will see in the next chapter. Uh, they're going to occur throughout the tribulation, which is the time from Christ's ascent into heaven until his return. So we're giving another vision of life on earth throughout history until the last day comes. Uh, these archangels act within and under the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They blow their trumpets, even as Christ speaks with a trumpet-like voice. Remember that he had that trumpet-like voice? So they are going to blow their trumpets as commanded. They're not acting of their own volition. Okay, so verses 3 to 5 which was, right, gathering up, uh, standing at the incense altar with the censer. He was given a bunch of incense with the prayers. Okay, so that's priestly action. Uh, that passage has been, uh, that, that action has been interpreted because it says another angel. You know, so it's still another angel. That has been interpreted as another angel. It has been interpreted as Christ himself because he is the intercessor of the saints. He's the one that receives the prayers of the saints. Uh, and he's also the one all alone who is in control of the events that are about to take place. Uh, so he's the sole mediator between God and man. Uh, and holds that golden censer full of much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints. Our prayers are offered through Jesus Christ, like we just heard about in church today, right? He's our only intercessor. So he makes sure those prayers are put on the altar in heaven. So the angel fills his golden censer with fire from the altar, and he throws that fire on the earth, beginning the sevenfold trumpet judgments. And Christ is often depicted as an angel in the Old Testament. He's the angel of the Lord. So... Most of the time when you see an angel of the Lord, you can read that as the Son. That's the pre-incarnate Christ. So is that is that Jesus we're seeing here in chapter 8? Very likely. Does it have to be? No. But it's an angel acting under God's command, so ultimately he's acting under Christ's command, so it may as well be. That's just one of those things. Is it, isn't it? It doesn't actually matter. 
uh, as long as we realize that God is the one that is in charge. Okay, so then verse six, now that everything is ready, that angel commissions the seven archangels to blow their trumpets. And then verse seven, trumpet number one. All right, that judgment corresponds to the seventh plague of Egypt, which was Exodus 9, 22 to 25. Um, unlike that plague, this judgment isn't to be taken literally. So as if we should expect some point in time, we're gonna see literal hail and literal fire mixed with blood falling on the earth sometime in the future. No. Uh, can that happen? Yes. Well, of course it could happen, but I think that's some of what I struggle with is, well, what is literal and what is, um, uh, what's the other word? The allegorical or, yeah. or, or uh, uh, symbolic, symbolic is the best word. Yeah. Uh, you're, everything in this book is symbolic. It, it's apocryphal literature. It's deliberately written that way. Um, and again, it's written in that symbolic code, one to protect you know, the bishop of the seven churches, John, is protecting his people. He's sending, he's smuggling this out of prison. It's right. being read. Yeah, the Romans would never And they're going to go, writing. they're just going to go, yeah, this is that Jewish crap. Yeah, the ramblings of a madman. Yeah, exactly. Which is what Luther said about a revelation at some point in his career before he figured it out. Those exact words, by the way. Yeah, so they, they're going to go, yeah, oh, this is just some Jewish crap. Let it go. Uh, but they're going to read it because they know their Old Testament. They're going to absolutely understand that, number one, this is an apocalyptic vision. And, oh, he's calling on this vision of the ancient days in Ezekiel. And he's calling on this and he's calling on that. He's talking about the plagues of Egypt here. Mm -hmm. So is it is it going to be, at some point, literal hit, fire? No, it's not. This is something that has to mean something to the first century Christians and to us and everybody in between, it's gotta mean the same thing. So it is an allegory, right? Would so go, Would you go so far as to say it would just be like a disaster? Well, I'm gonna explain it, what it is. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so instead of a literal plague, this judgment indicates that throughout the New Testament era, which we are in, the earth will constantly suffer the destruction of warfare, natural disasters, causing parts of the earth to be inhabitable, inhabitable, inha inhabitable, inhabitable, they can't live there. Inhab why is that it's word similar? Un uninhabitable. Uninhabitable. Uninhabitable, yes, yes, there we go. It's like, that's not the right word. Yeah, uninhabitable and unproductive to the human race, which, yeah, there's places like that. You, we just can't go. Um, a third of the earth was burned up. Well, how much of the earth was in the desert? It's growing. A third of the trees were burned up. You know, it used to be tropical rainforest from nearly Arctic Circle to Antarctic Circle at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not talking about climate change, just saying the green grass mm -hmm. was burned up. So mm -hmm. oh, I, that brings up a, the thing I want to ask later about the trees. Okay. So, warfare, natural disaster, climate change, whatever. Parts of the earth are on a heaven and it says a third, a third, a third, a third, a third. Just means some, not all. Okay, so the earth are going to be, the earth will suffer these judgments. The earth suffers for our sin. From the fall into sin, the earth has sucked. It's not like it was created to be. It's broken, just like us. And it will continue to be until Jesus comes back and he remakes everything. So in the meantime, it's not going to be totally destroyed, but it's not going to be good. Then verses eight and nine, trumpet number two, this affects the sea. Just like we saw how sin affects the land, we see now how sin affects the sea. It corresponds to the first plague in Egypt. So throughout the New Testament era, the waters of the earth will be destructive to us as well. You have volcanic eruptions, you have tsunamis, you have hurricanes, you have shipwrecks. And the waters, like the land, will not always yield their best. I mean, you can't always, I mean, you just, there's not cod everywhere anymore. No, we've they're being fished it all. harvested. And... Okay, so the, the oceans are broken. All right, so again, a third. Some is useless, some is uninhabitable, some has a big island of plastic on it, and other parts are fine. So some, not all again. 
And then verses 10 to 11, trumpet number three. So a great star falls from heaven upon a third of the rivers and the springs of water. So we've seen uh, the oceans, and now we're going to see the fresh water being affected by sin. So the star's name is Wormwood, which is a little on the nose, but it's a bitter poison, which is related to the second judgment, corresponds to the first Egyptian plague where uh, the earth, the, they made the water uh, in Egypt undrinkable. So this indicates throughout the New Testament era that some of the earth's fresh waters will be unsuitable for our consumption and then drinking from those waters will result in disease, sickness, and death. Do we see that today? Yeah. Did you see that back then? Yes. And will we continue to see it? Yes, we will. Okay, so we see, we're seeing from like a God's eye view, looking at the world, like, okay, the land is broken, the oceans are broken, the fresh water is broken. Now, verse 12, trumpet number four. Well, hang on a second. What okay. is the great star that fell from heaven? And a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. So what is that? Um, Meteor? No, I, it, it, some people interpret it. Now, again, you can't interpret it as like, well, this is the last day. Are there going to be meteors on the last day? Maybe, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I'm going to say, if you look at the way Wormwood was always associated with judgment in the Old Testament, that uh, that it's showing you like this is this is the judgment of God falling to the earth and striking mm -hmm. the earth and causing this problem. Um, and some also make it an allegory of Jesus seeing Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's what it says here. Okay, so. That could be, um, or a celestial disturbance, because then you're getting, you know. But like we're going to see. We're going to see in chapter not the very beginning of the next chapter. We're going to see a star falling from heaven, and that's Satan. So it's Satan being cast to earth. So I'm going to say, okay. I'm going to say, no, it's not Satan. And even when Jesus said, "I saw Satan fall like lightning," he wasn't reminiscing to Satan's being cast out of heaven. Mm -hmm. He was talking about when the 72 came back and said, Jesus, you know, everybody listened to us and, and we were casting out demons and people were believing in you and this is awesome. And Jesus' reply to them was, I saw Satan falling like, like uh, lightning from heaven. Basically just saying, this is what it's going to be when the gospel goes out. It's mm -hmm. going to defeat Satan once and for all mm -hmm. because that's, he has more power than he does. Uh, so he wasn't referring to the day it happened when, the angels rebelled. Mm -hmm. So even Jesus was being allegorical. So is it an allegory of an allegory? That's too many allegories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so is it is it a literal meteor that's going to poison the water? It can happen. Mm -hmm. And big meteor impacts have happened. We see the evidence of it. So mm -hmm. is, is it a literal uh, meteor of some sort? Maybe. Comet? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The point is it doesn't matter. Right. It doesn't matter which you decide. It's going to happen. Yeah. However you describe it. Yeah. Either we're going to see the water continue to be poisoned because we're going to see it that way because mm -hmm. that's just the way this broken world is going to be. Or toward the end, is this something going to happen? Well, we do know the sky is going to roll up like a scroll and the mountains are going to be moved into the heart of the sea. There's going to be some upheaval going on. Mm -hmm. Sure. And the point is, you don't have to answer all the, what is this? And there's right. still things that you're going to ask me, and go, what does that mean? I have no idea, and neither is anybody else. Mm -hmm. there's, there's one or two things we just don't know what they mean. They're lost. Yeah, it's uh, not really going to matter. Yeah, nobody's salvation hinges on it. Uh, but yeah, so it could be any of those things. Right, so verse 12, trumpet 4. So now we've seen the land, the water. Affected by God's judgment, so now we see what happens to the sky, right? The heavens. So now we've seen earth, land, sea. Now we see the ninth plague, an allusion to the ninth plague, the plague of Egypt, right? The darkness. So throughout the New Testament era, heavenly bodies will be struck in such a way as to cause suffering to the human race on earth. What did that mean? I don't know. Could be like you know, if the when you get the volcano eruption, when you get these really big ones, how they the, the sky is polluted mm -hmm. with the ash and the dust, and you just people within that vicinity cannot see 
anything, or it could be, say, like a, a nuclear holocaust where um, things get really scary. Yeah, like a nuclear winter type situation. Yeah. Sure. Um, it's a, a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining. Okay, so we did see the darkness in Egypt. And we did see the darkness on Good Friday. There was a supernatural darkness that took place. Uh, and what is happening here? There's cosmic stuff going on there. You know, again, is there going to be a meteor impact? Is there going to be what have you? Could be. Uh, could be. Um, and you look at, like, look at uh, that big meteor that went streaking through Russia not long ago, a couple years ago. I mean, that blew out windows miles and miles away. You look at the big one that was recorded in the early 1900s, I want to say it was. People were reading newspapers at midnight by, like, meteor light. That's how bright this thing was. Hmm. Uh, so strange things happened in the sky that aren't necessarily good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so what does it mean literally or figuratively? It, it doesn't. Again, it doesn't matter specifically. And that's one of the ones we really... Hmm? But at this point, we're still not taken up into heaven. The, the believers are still here on earth. Yeah, the world, world hadn't ended yet. So. Okay, I, I just want to get a... That's usually the end of the sun full vision. Usually lightning, thunder, earthquake. That's the end. That's usually when it ends. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to get a time frame of... Where am I in all this? Yeah, so all this stuff is happening and it's going to continue to happen. But specifically, and this is one of the ones where we just got to go, I don't know what it means. I don't know what this one means. Mm -hmm. That one's just weird. Of course, don't forget, even as early, as late as, you know, like 10 years ago, people see a comet in the sky and they get weird. It's like, oh, you know, this is, uh, this is a sign, you know, and people in Jesus' time were like that. People in Luther's time was like that. To the Heaven's Gate people were like that. It's like, oh, you know, there's a spaceship behind the comet and they're going to come get us and drink mm. the Kool-Aid, right? People think comets are weird. So you remember that cult a few, a few years ago, the Heaven's Gate guys? Mm -hmm. Didn't they all, like, they all were found dead in their bunks and mm -hmm. they had their shoes on. Yeah, like, they had their so, Nikes on, had yeah. their Nikes, right? Yeah. It was very specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and you got your Scientologists that Apologies to anybody who is hearing this on the internet, but you're Fruit Loop Scientologists that believe your gods are hidden in a volcano, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. People see signs in the sky and they go a little bonkers. Yeah, but um, you said you're going to see all that stuff, but the end is not yet. Right, exactly. So that's the way I look at it is things are going to happen, maybe even weird, terrible things we haven't even seen yet, but, you know, guess what? It's still not... You're not going to know when, you, when you'll know when it is, and that ain't it. Mm -hmm. So these things are going to happen, and it's okay. Like Jesus said, you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars, and that's okay. That's going to happen. Okay. Um, then verse 13. In the Old Testament, many, many announcements of coming judgment include the in, image of an eagle as a metaphor. And guess what the symbol for St. John in art is? An eagle. It's an eagle. So, do I have that on this? Yeah, I have that on this one. Yeah, so the symbol in art for the evangelist St. John is an eagle. So the uh, eagle is always a metaphor for destruction. You can look at Deuteronomy 28, Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah 48, Jeremiah 49, Lamentations 4, Ezekiel 17, Hosea 8, Habakkuk chapter 1, uh, all over the Old Testament you have eagles. Particularly relevant is in Hosea chapter 8 verse 1, put the trumpet to your lips like an eagle, the enemy comes against the house of the Lord. And then Jeremiah 4, 3, the image of the eagle, as it are, or the, the destructive image of an eagle is followed by a voice saying, woe to us. And John's directly referring to that uh, with a threefold sounding of trumpet in the case of in uh, Jeremiah. So does so does the fact that our American symbol is an eagle, does that play into like 
all of like biblical because I know. No, it's purely because the eagle is strong. Okay. Right. Now, when it's a mighty hunter. Yeah. So it's a okay. symbol of strength. Yeah, none, none of the biblical symbolism has anything to do with the American symbols. I just wonder because they, you know, like they were. Yeah, because in fact, in the, in the Bible, the eagle is a metaphor for destruction. Right. It's not a good it's not symbol good. Uh, because they hover, they look for their prey, and then they pounce on it. Uh, so in, in Jeremiah chapter 4 and 5, there are woes which signal that uh, the next... These woes here signal the next trumpets in the vision are going to be worse than the ones we've already seen, okay? Uh, which we see that same usage of the word the woes in Jeremiah chapter 4 and 5. So if you go back, go, yeah, this is where John, John is seeing this vision and he's pulling on his knowledge of the Old Testament to make sense of it and to lay it out on paper. All right, so these next three trumpets are going to be worse because that's what the eagle tells us. Uh, so now we're going to shift from natural disaster, because it's what all these first ones have been, you know, where this is a God's eye view of the earth in a fallen world. You see all the natural things, why the earth is busted, why the heavens are busted, right? Now we're going to see it's going to get worse because these are going to be the demonic uh, forces. So these are going to be supernatural attack instead of just natural disaster. On the other hand, and this is a thought by a guy named uh, uh, Thomas Messer, pastor, Lutheran pastor, said this eagle that announces the threefold woe, even though he's a symbol of destruction, he could be a source of comfort because we know no matter what, Jesus Christ is in control. He is in control about everything that's gonna unfold, even this bad stuff that's gonna happen. He's still in, in control. Uh, so we can rest assured that even as he delivered the Israelites out of Egypt on eagles' wings, right, he is going to deliver us through this series of judgments on the earth that's taking place. So it's actually woe, woe, woe to those who don't have Christ on their side. So it's not necessarily all bad for us. That is the end of chapter 9. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. So then as we go into chapter 9, we will see... Satan, we're going to see Lucifer, the light bringer, the fallen star, the star of the morning. It's actually all these words that are also used sometimes to refer to Christ, the morning star. Well, another name for Satan is the morning star because he's a copycat. You know, when you were talking about archangels, Lucifer was one of the mighty angels, but he wasn't an archangel then. Or was he? The term archangel was never used. I'd almost have to say he was because he was the ringleader of all the other fallen. Yeah, God. God and and he special. was and he was the most beautiful of the angels. You know, yeah. Right, so is he an archangel? Does it matter? It, um, I know it doesn't matter, but you know, when you were going through the names. But yeah, it's like, well, he's got a different name. His, his name doesn't mean b -b -b God, right? So I would say no. He's not an archangel because he doesn't have a name like an archangel. Because you have Raphael. L means God. Mike A L, God Ray L. And then Satan. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So it's not an archangelly name. No, no. But, I'm just curious. Right, but he's the prince of this world, and we're gonna see him on the scene wreaking havoc above and beyond all the natural problems that the earth has in a fallen world. So that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna get. Next week, as we do chapter nine, because I don't want to get too far ahead. It's a longer chapter. Yeah, I was going to say it is. Eight was short. Yeah, eight was short. You know, like ten is short. Eleven short. Actually, eleven's not short, and it's weird. So we're we're getting to. We'll have another interlude, right? We're going to see the trumpet angels, and then you're going to have this interlude with the angel and the scroll, and then the, the interlude with the two witnesses. And it's like, what is that all about? Uh, there's bizarre stuff, these bizarre visions, and then you get into uh, the really ugly parts. You know, then we'll see the seventh trumpet because it's like, but wait, because it's, well, Revelation is a Quentin Tarantino movie. Its parts are scattered, and then they all come back together again. And then we'll see 
the woman coated with the sun and the great red dragon. And then we'll see um, Satan thrown out to earth. And then we see the beasts, right? The, the beast, the great red dragon, and then the beast from the sea, the beast from the land, who they are. And that's going to keep us busy for a while. Because there's a lot of stuff people misinterpret with that. And it's not that complicated. Yeah, it's pulled right out of the Old Testament. Wow. So that is where we'll be next time. All right, Cal, let me ask you my question. Sure. Okay, thinking back to creation, um, God is creating everything. Yeah. At first, my first thoughts are when he, um, you know, creates the trees and, and the grasses and the flowers and all that, that it's like there's a tree, the giant sequoias are, are right there, fully mature, and you know, the maples and the chestnuts and everything else, and you know, the grasses perfectly, and then the flowers. And then I started thinking about it, and the more I thought about it, it's like, well, especially over here in, the, in our country, with the fertile plain and that, it's like, well, heck, he could have just planted seeds down and not made them mature. You know, I, I don't realize that none of this really matters but just here's my theory on that because I this is something I use when I'm arguing with atheists about yeah, well, well, in creating six days okay regardless of whether you think it's 24 hour days or some other period the Hebrew word yom means day as in literal 24 hour day that is the position of Lutheran Church Missouri Senate six 24 hour days fine yeah, regardless of what you think about that when God created, you look at the way he created things. Well, okay, if I look at the geology and look at the sedimentation and I calculate an age for the earth, well, if we study, actually study science and we study probability and you study quantum mechanics, all the implications of that, God didn't just create the world and go, there. He created a universe already in progress. So of course, it's gonna look like you can look back in time billions of years because he built it and set it in motion already moving. Because you can't just have the universe and flick a switch and go turn it on and it starts doing its like dance. Some giant machine it can't do, you can't do that. That's not how the laws of the universe work. That, that's not how you ordained it the laws of the universe work. So you look at the laws of the universe and say, okay, so he created a universe already in progress, albeit perfect. But there's baby trees, there's full-grown trees, there's pine cones, okay, there's sproutlings, sproutlings, saplings, seedlings, seedlings, sproutlings. We don't talk so good on Sunday afternoon. <laughs> so uh, he created a universe already in progress. I mean, look at it, it makes sense. And, and, and actually, from a scientific standpoint, it makes perfect sense. When did he make light? Light? Yeah. Is that the... Like the first thing he made? Let there be yeah. light, and there was light. Mm -hmm. When did he make the sun, moon, and stars? That's the third or fourth day. Fourth day. Mm -hmm. So he made the light. Moving. And then he made the things that generate the light, and he hung them where they need to be. But, you know, light is a particle and a wave, and people listening can't see me making the grandiose hand gestures I'm flailing around right now, but he put the light beams in place. So if a galaxy is like a 30 billion light years away, and he put the light from that galaxy in place, already in progress, already moving, because food there. So, well, it's like, well, you were camping because we can see these galaxies. Yeah, and he made the light and he put it there and quantum mechanically and entanglemently Everything has to be that way if he created it. He couldn't create it any other way or he wouldn't have the laws of nature we have. It had to be made in progress. And that leads you to another bunch of startling conclusions like the Star of Bethlehem because he knew before he made us, we were going to fall. He knew he was going to send his son into a flush to be our savior. So he knew he was going to send the Star of Bethlehem to lead people to the newborn Messiah. So while he was there, he hung this light from that star where it needed to be wherever however convoluted path it has to follow gravitationally so that it could be at the right time at the right place and oh now it's perched over and a manger and then it goes away and whatever screwball corkscrew path it has to follow through time to do that well he took care of that on day one when he made the light 
because he knew he had to do that. And he is, you know, God. So don't say, well, God can't do that. No, he's God. He's outside of time and space. He invented time and space. He can do whatever he wants. But he made a universe that follows rules. And all this stuff I just said follows rules. And guess what? It also follows the Bible. So I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> so, <sighs> so essentially what you're saying is... No, it's not saying God's being deceitful and he made everything look old. No, he wouldn't do that. It isn't. It's actually old. He made it old. But he made it when it was brand new. It was old. It's created, not the same thing. <laughs> created old. He created a universe already in progress. Okay. Ready for man to screw up <laughs> from day one. But yeah. yeah. So, you know, there were full-grown trees, mm -hmm. seedlings. Um, they're just what you'd expect now to look out into a prairie or the woods in, and look at, at that. Okay. Absolutely. From day one. All right. That makes sense. I can. I mean, there was there was ripe fruit. There was not ripe yet fruit. There was whatever. Um, and then he made people. Now that begs the question, and well, it's not really begging the question. It's not using that right. But that that gives you the question: Well, did plants die? Did they? I mean, were they eternal? Because it, its seed was he said be fruitful and might multiply to the plants and animals, you know, the plants and animals. So did plants die and decay? Death hadn't entered the world yet? I don't know. Or was that just for people? Were animals vegetarians? Which some people would make the case for that, that... Yeah, they weren't meat eaters until... They weren't meat eaters until the fall. Yeah. Um, so, but plants, did they... Mm, I don't know. That's one of those things that's fun to think about. We could probably argue, and you could probably make a good argument for both sides of it. In the end, it really doesn't matter. Right. Adam didn't have the lawnmower to mow the grass. No, he did not. He had goats. He had goats. He had the goats and the cows to, to munch on that. And... You know, it's kind of like... I mean, there's all kinds of fun things you can think of from, from that part of the Bible. Like, uh, and now we're just rambling. I'm just rambling. But... Uh, you know, like the covenant of the rainbow. Well, why did God have to make a covenant about the rainbow? Because, okay, now the rainbow means I'm never going to destroy the earth by water again. Well, why did he have to do that? Because it never rained before the That's flood. What you were telling me right? That, you know, so, so now, yeah, well, what about rainbows all the time? What all the time? It never rained before. It says that the water came up out of the earth, and everybody says, "There's not that much." Yes, there is, and they're like, con "They just like discovered a whole bunch more water." Like, oh yeah, there's a lot more water down there than we thought. Mm -hmm. So, do you think he created salt water and fresh water, or is salt water the result of sin? Well, no, because he created the sea creatures too. So, I would say that there was salt water and fresh water. All right, so he created. Yeah, I think I, I think sure he did both. If, I would, I would say he did both. Okay, because you'd almost make the case that salt water would be... Um, yeah, is that revolt the result of the fall? Yeah, I don't know. You know, and then you, and you can talk about, and I mean, we can argue about dinosaurs, all people on it, but, you know, you look at, well, you know, after the flood, there's no, not that many ginormous creatures anymore, well, because there's, the, the atmosphere is completely changed after the flood from all that water and all that moisture. Yeah, that completely changed the climate. Talking about climate change, stuff can't grow that big no more. Yeah. So that's why dinosaurs are little, and then you have whatever. Yeah. Then you talk about the insects, and there was somebody complaining on Facebook about all the stink bugs. It's like, no, why did Noah let the stink bugs on the ark? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, maybe there weren't any stink bugs back then. I mean. Evolution does happen. It doesn't happen that one thing turns into another thing. No, it's but everything's. But, I mean, scientists have watched things turn into another species. Mm -hmm. That's, but it, it, the fun thing is, you know what the scientists said? Wow, that happened a lot sooner than we thought it would. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, really? <laughs> okay. But. Well, you know, it's frustrating is when they think they just throw enough time at something oh, yeah. and they give chance the power of uh, creation or mm -hmm. something. It's like chance is just a term we use to explain. Yeah, that is what, that's because they turn evolution into a religion. 
which requires more faith than believing in God. And hey, I admit, sometimes evolution has some attractive qualities to it, but we don't have, show me the fossil evidence of a thing turning into another thing, like fish evolving to frogs. If you're a fish or you're a frog, you're good at being a fish or a frog. But if you're something in between, you're not a good fish, you're not a good frog, which means you are food, which means there should be fossils of you everywhere and there's not, so. And yes, I'm being specious, specious to the people listening on the internet, but you see my point. There are no intermediary fossils because there aren't any intermediary fossils. No. Yeah, so. No, no, I don't have, I don't have a problem with the Bible with anything it says in the creation account according to science. But I think sometimes people make their science into a religion. It doesn't necessarily have to be. And I say that as someone who is trained formally in science as a chemist and a physicist, that for those also listening on the internet that I actually know what I'm talking about. And you'd be surprised how many scientists don't actually agree with it. Well, when you try to deny the existence of God, you can do all kind of gymnastics to justify a particular stance, just to stay away from acknowledging, yeah, there is someone, something that created all this. Well, yeah. You know, and I can understand it because from our frame of reference, it's incomprehensible. Which because, it should be. Because you have God who is outside of time and space because he created time and space. We are bound by time and space, trying to perceive well, what's outside the universe. Physicists have been asking that question forever and they can't answer it. What's outside the universe? God, <laughs> right? Right, at the edge of the universe, it's like, well. Yeah, you can't answer the question because you have no frame of reference. You have no you you have no way of comprehending something outside the universe. So, so uh, there might as well be nothing, because you can't. Right, and how do you comprehend, comprehend nothing? Like, how do, what does it mean to be outside of time? Okay, so if you fall in a black hole, boom, you're in a, a, a compressed area of infinite space time. You're now outside of time. What is that like? You can't answer that because we're bound by time. You can't. It is not for us to know. Well, since God's outside of time and space. You can't prove he exists because the only things we have to make proofs from are bound by time and space. So what is outside time and space? God. Prove me wrong. I mean, you can't. As much as I can't prove God exists. I mean, I can prove God exists in my way from the things I see, but to, to definitively prove, you can't because we... You can't we, put God under the microscope and say, well, here's the God particle. Yeah, because if you can put God under the microscope, then by definition, you are God's God. Because you have to be outside and beyond God's bounds. So right. it, would, it would make God a created entity. Right. So who created God, right? That's the question. Yeah. So that's where I'll leave our discussion for today, because that's enough to think about. <laughs>